For those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. Hey, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Great. Awesome. So, firstly, we want to thank two different companies for supporting us to do tonight's program, and I hope that you all let them know that we appreciate them doing this. The first one is Celgene. There you go. All right, the next one is Sanofi Genzyme. All right, now, just so you know, we get around, like I said, we get around all over the country doing these programs, but we cannot do these programs without their support. And they want to give us the support in doing this because they want you all to learn from what's happening. So tonight, you're going to listen with Dr. Nagroski. He's going to speak about the, the needs of a compre comprehensive healthcare team uh, for care partners, a discussion on the care partners and what they can do, also understanding the needs of having all of these things in place. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Nagroski. And Dr. Nagroski, most of you do know, but for those that don't, he's medical director of the MS Center of Sarasota. He's clinical assistant professor at Florida State University. He recently was named ASA partner in MS Care by the National MS Society. He's a medical advisor for MS Views and News. Great, I like that. Round of applause, right? <laughs> He's a member of the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers, has presented at national and international MS conferences, and has contributed to a number of clinical trials and published books in the field of MS. Let's welcome Dr. Nagroski. You found your way through the maze. Great. There's no mic stand, so you have to hold That's this fine. tonight. All right? Great. Thank you. But I thought you had some germs on it, though. Yeah, so be careful. Okay. I have, I have uh, oh, here we go. I got the, uh, the sanitizer. We can do it. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Stu, for uh, the kind invitation and introduction, and welcome to Sarasota. It's, uh, you know, Stu's from the other side of Florida. I think the, anyone the from side. the what? The bright, side. the bright side, and this is the dark side, or what? <laughs> Yeah, okay. So listen, uh, this is going to be an exciting uh, talk. I, I haven't given this before. Uh, it's something different. We're not going to talk about MS medication specifically, but I'm going to talk about how you make decisions in your care. And MS is a complicated disease. Each person's journey with MS is entirely different. Their care partner's journey with MS is entirely different. The way physicians treat patients is entirely different. So you have to kind of get all everyone on the same page. So I'm going to talk about partnering and understanding comprehensive health care and kind of look at the, the health care team and all the members. So we're going to talk about a couple topics. One is the uh, multidiscipline team approach of treating patients with MS. We all know that patients with MS have a myriad of uh, issues. They need to make the right decisions in terms of the disease-modifying therapies. You have to have a nice communication with your treating neurologist. You need a team of other people. PT, OT, speech therapy, exercise uh, uh, team members. We're going to talk about the goals of treatment in MS in general, not just uh, MS uh, disease, but MS symptoms, some of the goals of treatment. And we'll talk briefly about disease-modifying therapies. But I want to shape the conversation with disease-modifying therapies with the way the drug works in your system, in your immune system. So um, I'm gonna kind of lump the drugs in certain ways it, uh, they work in your immune system. More importantly, communication between the team members and the person with MS. That's the goal of the talk, to try to drill down how you communicate your MS issues with the members of the, your team. And I want to say your team. So, and then that's called shared decision making. There's different models of shared decision making, basically four, and we'll go over those towards the end of the talk. So, so why do you uh, have a multidiscipline team approach? The goal 
in MS therapy and anything actually is to embrace a ph philosophy of empowerment. So it sounds good, empowerment, but I had to look up that definition and I'll take off my glasses so I can read it. So a uh, definition of empowerment is the authority given to somebody to do something. The authority given to somebody to do something. Just think about that. You know, for if you're an MS patient or an MS caregiver, to become stronger and more confident especially in controlling one's life. So that, that boils MS therapy down to a T. You have to be empowered uh, to take control of your disease. So how do you do that? You have to be an active participant in the team. You can't just be a passive. You have to be the center. If you're going to uh, be empowered, you have to take control, as I just mentioned and you, you're empowered to do something um, about it. So we use a team approach because it facilitates coordination of care. You talk about a urologist, neurologist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, and all kinds of different services that are needed to take care of MS patients. So you need a kind of a team approach, and when you have a team approach, it may avoid duplication of services. So you need a captain of the team, and then the, the captain of the team is actually the patient. If you boot. Um, so if you have a captain of the team, you, you don't have fragmentation of services. And all the team members have to communicate with each other because you're spinning your wheels if you go to Dr. X or Dr. Y or therapist X and Y and they don't send me the information and then you come in and I don't know what you did and all that stuff. So then you end up repeating things that have already been done. So why do we need that? MS is entirely a variable disease. That's that's why it's um, that's why a lot of neurologists uh, prefer not to treat MS patients because each person is entirely different. It's not a cookie cutter disease. For those of you that have MS in the room, if you look to the right of you and the left of you for uh, different MS patients, your disease course may be entirely different. And you have to be treated differently in terms of symptoms and, and drugs, and there, it, it's, it's, it's complicated. Not only it's a variable disease, but there's different patterns. Do you have a relapsing pattern? Do you have a progressive pattern? What pattern of disease that you have? So in order to establish a pattern, you need time. So from day one, I couldn't tell a patient when they're first diagnosed what pattern they have. The only way that you know is to follow a patient over time. Then you get a pattern. Patients have different patterns. They have different phases. You can have the same pattern of the disease, but the phase of your journey with MS can be different when you're first diagnosed and what's important you, to you in terms of treatment when you're first diagnosed could be different when you're halfway through your course of the disease or you're retired and not working. So your, your phase of the disease is entirely different. So what worked 10 years ago may not work now. Different types of impairments, obviously. Some patients have more physical impairments. Some patients have more cognitive impairments. So, and that can change over the course of the disease. That leads to a wide range of symptoms. And symptom management is, is you know, very important for patients with MS not just disease management, that's what neurologists like to think about, choosing the right drug to modify the disease course, but patients, I think, are more interested in treating symptoms, a result of the disease. Perhaps fatigue, walking, stiffness, things like that, relapses. So that leads to this term, a dynamic approach to MS. 
So the terms that I want you to uh, walk away with uh, today is empowerment, you have to be empowered, and you have to have a dynamic approach to treatment of MS disease through the course. You have to be nimble and adjust your wishes, and the neurologist should be nimble as well and kind of understand where you're coming from. So I'll kind of uh, uh, get into that later on. So this just drives home a point that all patients with MS are not the same. So when I first see a patient, they want to know what kind of, what's going to happen in five years, 10 years, 20 years. So we now have some data uh, to kind of answer that if you have followed a patient for about five years to see what kind of pattern. So the patients with some of these things, they have a more stormy course down the road after five years. And that may translate to treating these patients somewhat more aggressively with more aggressive medications, maybe following them more aggressively with frequent visits, frequent scans, getting their care partners involved. So these are the things that we kind of worry about. If you have MS and you're a non-Caucasian, that is a risk factor for worsening of the disease, especially African-American uh, uh, men. Multiple deficits when you first present. What does that mean? That means if you, your first symptom of MS could be maybe optic neuritis or visual problems, and then you also have walking problems. That's two symptoms, just not one. So if you have multiple deficits when you first uh, present to the neurologist, that's a kind of a, a red flag. If you're on treatment and you have numerous relapses or attacks or exacerbations, it's all the same thing. So if you're on treatment for the first five years and assuming that you're inherent, and I'll talk about adherence later on, the importance of that. So if you're adherent and you have attacks, multiple attacks, that's not a good thing. So you may have to reevaluate that particular treatment. If you have attacks and the intervals between attacks are really short, so having attacks of MS uh, is they're not good because maybe around 40% of the time you don't get back to the way you were before. So if you have one attack after one attack after one attack, it just slowly uh, increases your disability as time goes on. High MRI lesion. So, and again, we're gonna talk about MRIs. But if you have more spots in your brain or spinal cord in the first five years, that's not a good thing, right? You have more disease burden. It's called disease burden. So you have to uh, monitor patients closely, especially in the first five years with MRIs. And in general, we tend to recommend MRIs on a yearly basis. If you have MS in your spine, that should be scanned as well kind of frequently to make sure you're not having more lesions. The last thing that we look at is what kind of MS symptoms that you have. So if you have motor problems and it's more difficult for you to walk from here to there because your legs are weak or they're stiff or whatever, that's not good. Cerebellar speaks to balance. If your balance is off, because the gyroscope mechanism of your brain is affected and your balance is off, that's, uh, we don't like that. If you have bowel and bladder involvement early on, so if you have urinary incontinence and bowel and bladder dysfunction early on, that's a risk factor for increased disability. Bowel and bladder, if you have bowel and bladder, that's often seen in patients with spinal cord involvement and your spinal cord is about the size of thickness of your thumb. So if you have a small lesion in your spinal cord, it can do a lot of things because there's not a lot of real estate in your spinal cord. If you have a small lesion in your brain, 
and part of your brain that has the lesion really doesn't do that much because you have a lot of real estate in your brain, you may not have any symptoms. So spinal cord involvement and a lot of times if you have bowel and bladder dysfunction, that's a marker of spinal cord involvement. Sometimes you can have maybe 8 to 10 to 12 more lesions in the brain before you have any symptoms whatsoever. Because that term uh, in real estate is location, location, location. It depends where that lesion ends up. So lesions aren't good, but the locations are more important. So let me talk about the healthcare team. So neurologist, a neurologist is not a neurosurgeon. I get that a lot. I go to places and they go, I said, what are you, you know, what do you do? And I said, neurologist, and they go, yeah, I have trouble going to the bathroom. You know, and I go, no, not urologist, neurologist, all the time. You know, I got, I, I, I go, it's up here. You know, so neurologist, and then uh, MS is becoming extremely complicated in terms of the number of drugs. There's probably what 17, 18 FDA approved drugs now, and how the drugs are sequenced, the effects on the immune system, how you treat uh, MS patients are becoming extremely complicated. And that's why I think a lot of MS patients enjoy seeing an MS specialist. So just like uh, different specialties, cardiology, uh, orthopedics, they're, they're, you know, some, some orthopedic people only work on shoulders or hips and stuff like that. So neurologists um, um, are, are also specialized in different things. So MS neurologist, people don't realize that there's this thing called physician extenders. And there's going to be a shortage of neurologists coming down the pike. I think there's only about 2 to 3% of people coming out of medical school that want to go into neurology for various reasons. So there is going to be a more and more stress or more kind of uh, insight on physician's assistants and ARNPs advanced uh, uh, registered nurse practitioners. So physician extenders. The person with MS is in the middle of this team, near the, like the hub. You're, the neurologist is not the hub. It's the, the person that's empowered. Care partners are also very, very vital. And I applaud all the care partners in the room uh, that uh, came out tonight uh, because it's uh, it's really really supportive. People don't realize office staff behind the scenes. So I'm I'm blessed and privileged to have you know a, like an A team office staff because especially with MS patients, the amount of uh, time behind the scenes in terms of getting drugs approved getting MRIs approved from insurance companies, getting things scheduled is, is daunting. It really is. It takes, it, you almost have to hire one or two extra staff members to take care of MS patients because of all this stuff in the back side. Office staff, physical therapist, occupational therapist. They're not the same. Physical therapist uh, has to do with more ambulation and legs. To put it simply, occupational therapist is more hands. You know, how do you, how do you tie things and eat and button buttons? Speech and language uh, pathologist has to do with not only language and communication skills, but swallowing. And choking on uh, liquids, solids, coughing leads to bad things. So speech and language pathologists are important, as is a psychologist to help you deal and the care partners deal with uh, your journey with MS. Neuropsychologists are important because we now know, and we've known for a while, 
uh, that MS affects your cognitive abilities. So years ago, we didn't, we didn't think MS affected the gray matter. You know, between your ears is the gray matter, and the gray matter is just a rib, small ribbon of tissue over the surface of the brain in the nooks and crannies. So the human has tons of gray matter, but that's why it's folded in, you know, in, in the nooks and crannies. So the human brain has about, what, 26 billion brain cells? And one third of those 26 billion brain cells are crammed into the surface of the brain about the uh, thickness of a grain of rice. So listen, what, what color does that make that tissue? If you cram in a lot of brain cells, it makes it gray. The other parts of the brain are kind of white and it's white matter, and then you have white matter and gray matter. So a lot of cognitive issues and a lot of the research coming out now in MS is to look at the effects of drugs on gray matter. Because we know that, unfortunately, if you have MS, there's a higher incidence of shrinkage of your brain, about two to three to four times the normal shrinkage rate. So if your brain starts to shrink, the gray matter starts to shrink and you can have cognitive problems. You do an MRI <clears throat> on those patients and you may not even see the MS in the, in the that one millimeter surface because it's really hard to, to visualize, but it's there. Social worker is important. You know, how you, uh, you know, apply for like a bus pass or how you get uh, to point A and point B, um, different facilities, nutritionists you don't think about, but they're important. Other physicians, urologist, urologist, right? Um, cardiologist for some MS drugs are important. Pulmonary medicine doctors and your primary care physician. So it's important for everyone to be kind of on the same team. And what happens, especially with MS patients, uh, you go to your internist, which is like the captain of all the doctors. Everything should be fed into the, the uh, internist. But once you, they find out you have MS, the, in general, they automatically assume any problem that you have is related to the MS. So that's why it's important to have everyone on the same team. If there's a question, the internist will send the patient uh, back to the neurologist, and the neurologist will say, no, this is an MS, you should look uh, for something else. So don't, don't automatically assume all your symptoms are from MS. And the last thing I want to talk about is the legal portion of this, which is important. We're talking about disability paperwork, uh, employment relations, employer relations. Do you tell uh, an employer that you have MS? Do you don't? Um, you know, do you need to take some uh, medical leave or family medical leave? Their care partners are, you know, do they need to take some time off and care for somebody? So it's a big team. So the goals, as I mentioned, I want to go over with MS therapies. Highest possible quality of life. That's a, that's a huge goal. I don't know if it would be attainable, but that's, that's a goal. Function effectively. This is more pragmatic. Function effectively at home and with your family and at work. So effective functioning is different for each individual person. It depends what your goal is. You know, if, you, uh, if you're kind of driven, uh, you may get all stressed out if you can't reach that goal. If that's not your goal, uh, then, then you're less stressed out. So each person is a little bit different. Obviously, limit physical and cognitive disability. Brain health you don't think about. This comorbid health issues, comorbidities means a, another, another disease that, or a problem that you have. That's the medical term of a comorbid thing. So if you have MS and you have diabetes, it's a comorbid thing. It 
goes hand in hand if you have high blood pressure. So don't automatically, you know, discount other things. Because you can have the best MS care in the world, and then if your cholesterol is uh, through the roof and you don't exercise, you, you uh, don't, uh, don't have the proper diet, your sugar's out of whack, I mean, that's not good. And we know that a couple things that you can do is, is exercise, no smoking. Smoking makes MS more progressive. That's one thing that you can do. Is stop smoking, um, things like that. So I tend to think, uh, in general, what I can do for a patient is about 70%. You know, I just came up with the number. Maybe 70% of what I can do with medications to help a patient. 30% plus is what the patient can do for themselves. Proper diet, exercise, watch, uh, watch your weight, and watch your blood pressure, and all those things. Compensation strategies, it kind of adapts, things that you can adapt to. You know, if you have uh, cognitive problems, maybe you want to kind of do all your, your, your chores and cognitive chores first thing in the morning before you, you kind of run out of steam. Preventive measures. So some people's goals is to prevent hospitalizations. They say, my goal this year is not to be in a hospital. So we work on that. Another person says, I, my goal is to stay uh, ambul uh, ambulatory as much as possible. Another person will say, I don't want to relapse this year. So relapses are important. What's the, do you know the definition of a relapse? A relapse is something new or uh, existing that is worse over the, or for about 24 hours, some people say 48 hours, in absence of uh, flu or an infection or a fever. So that's kind of a relapse. So I need to know if a person has a relapse because, as I mentioned, relapses are not good. We have drugs uh, that will speed up the recovery of a relapse. So you have to have that conversation. Those are typical steroid-like medications or ACTH. So relapses, that's a goal. The goal of Non-relapse therapy is disease-modifying therapies, DMTs. It's not a cure. That's why we call it a disease-modifying therapy. It modifies the disease course. So for relapsing MS, obviously, a goal is to decrease relapses. For relapsing MS, also decrease lesion activity in the brain, number and sizes of lesions. So we, could, we can do an MRI and slice, it, slice your brain differently. When you're in the machine, you hear all those noises back and forth, and it sounds like a machine gun and all that. Uh, we're not doing that to punish you, but we're doing that to come up with different ways of looking at MRI lesions. When we do that, we can look at the total volume of disease burden, those scars, we can look at if some of those scars are permanent, and we can see if some of those scars are recent. So that's why you're in the machine a lot. It, it spits out different pictures of the same part of your brain. The big thing now is because of this brain shrinkage business, I said in the gray matter, as well as the, the whole brain, we're coming up, um, with measurements of atrophy. And we want, uh, a lot of the drugs are looking at the benefit of the drug to slow up brain atrophy and indirectly perhaps slow up cognitive decline. Limit or worsening of disability is a goal, right? There's this kind of semi-new term, improvement of disability, because you never thought of that before. 
you know, we're kind of looking at drugs to see if some patients' disability may actually improve. So the goal of uh, uh, relapsing MS patients or treatment is, is uh, to make MS inactive. We can't get rid of it, but we can see if MS becomes inactive versus active. So you want inactive MS. That means no relapses and no new MRI lesions. The other goal is that you don't want worsening of disability. So you can have one of those goals, two of those goals, or three of those goals. The fourth goal that is kind of the new buzzword now is brain atrophy. You don't want shrinkage. So that's kind of the, the uh, other goal that a lot of people are looking at. So how do you choose? So there's always, as you know, with, uh, with any MS therapies, there's always risk benefits. So the risk benefits may be different for a naive patient that has never been on an MS therapy before, maybe newly diagnosed. So their risk benefit may be different than if you're already on treatment and it's not working or you don't like the drug and maybe you have a different risk benefit. Some patients want the latest and greatest drug even though it doesn't have a long track record. Some patients want the drug that has the best track record and the least uh, amount of side effects. So each person is different. There's no right or wrong decision. We kind of debate back and forth when we treat patients with MS initially. There's two types of treatments, paradigms. There's a uh, induction approach where we use kind of more powerful drugs initially we induce treatment of MS aggressively. And then once it's kind of stabilized, we kind of cut back a little bit. We de-escalate. So remember that uh, slide several slides ago about those patients that we're worried about in the first five years? Maybe sometimes you'll do induction therapy on those patients. The second a paradigm is you don't do that. You start with relatively safer and weaker drugs and you wait till the shoe drops, so to speak. Maybe they have relapses, MRI activity, worsening of disability, and then you escalate therapy. We don't know what the best approach is. We really don't. So you have to have that conversation. Keep that in the back part of your mind when you talk to your neurologist. If he or she is an escalator uh, or a inductionist, right? So that uh, think about that. Switching. When do you switch? There's various reasons to switch. Obviously, if it's not working, for whatever definition you have, if you're poorly adherent to the drug, it won't work because you're not taking it. Convenience. Some patients. You know, convenience is a big thing. Some patients, as I mentioned, they're worried about rare, uh, rare serious side effects. Some patients are worried about less serious side effects that are more frequent. So again, I have to get in their head, they have to get in my head. We have to have a shared decision making. And that's what I'm gonna cover. So when you switch, you can switch differently. As I mentioned now, I mean, the first FDA-approved drug to change the disease course came out in 1993. Could you imagine? MS was described in the 1800s. And the first drug to change the disease course, called DMTs, was in 1993. And now we have you know, various uh, regular drugs and generic drugs, maybe 16, 17, soon to be several more. So now we can switch if something doesn't work. You can switch two ways. You can do a lateral move, which means that you choose a drug uh, with about the same efficacy and side effect profile and perhaps the same way it works in your immune system. Or you can switch, you can escalate therapy 
to something different, that works differently, that may have different side effects. So let's talk about the way the drug works in your immune system. So there's four types of ways that a immune system drug works in MS. So the immune cells are called the lymphocytes. They're part of the white blood cells in your bloodstream. When you go to your doctor's office, they do a CBC, complete blood count, and you take the paper at home, and then you go on the computer and you figure out what all these terms are because it could be a star or out of, la you know, out of whack, and then you get all worried about it. So you get the WBCs, which are the white blood cells, and under the WBCs you'll see a bunch of strange terms like eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, lymphocytes. You ever see those? You kind of, you know, if something's out of whack, you kind of Google that term. So they're part of the white blood cells. And my analogy is like chess. Anyone play chess? One person, two people, come on. Because it's not on the, can you play chess on the, on, the, on the phone, smartphones? Really? Oh. So, so a chess, it's like a chess piece. So the one, the white blood cells are like a chest, uh, chest side. And under the white blood cells are lymphocytes, eosinophils, blah, blah, blah. And each piece does a different thing. So the lymphocytes do more immune system business. So it's the lymphocytes that are abnormal in MS. And they're cir circulating around. And the lymphocytes are further divided into T and B cells. So what happens is that they get out of whack. And they seep through the brain, through this a barrier between the blood vessels and the brain and cause damage, cause those spots that you see on the MRI. So you can use drugs to change those lymphocytes. One way that you could use it is to change the way the lymphocytes function. So some lymphocytes are bad and some are good. Some causes inflammation, some don't cause inflammation. They inhibit. Inflammation is not good. So those cells, you can shift a bad cell to a good cell. So medications like uh, Copaxone, the interferons, the Avonex, uh, Rebif, Betaseron, medications like that influence the way the cells kind of function. Another way that you can treat MS is to uh, change the way they traffic in your bloodstream. Because immune cells are in the blood, they're in the lymph nodes, they're in the spleen, they circulate around. So some drugs uh, will in, sequester the, the lymphocytes in certain parts, like the lymph nodes. That's what Gelenia does. Some drugs will prevent the, the, uh, the cells from getting into the brain. That's what Tysabri does. Inhibit cell replication or division. If you have these active immune cells, what happens is they start to divide and multiply because they go haywire. And so some drugs like Abagio will decrease the replication of cells so you don't have as many. The last one is destruction or depletion of the cells. T and B cells kills them, like uh, Lemtrada and Ocrevus. So as I mentioned on this slide, here are types of switches. So if you have a drug that influences cell functioning, you may not, and you want to switch, maybe you may not want to go to the same type of drug that does the same thing. Maybe you want to try a different way of attacking your MS. So that's what I mean about, about uh, lateral switching and escalation. Make sense? Yeah. So what's really interesting is the, this uh, paper was just published in the Journal of MS Care in December uh, a couple months ago. They looked at 
patients that were non-inherent, they didn't take their medicine, then they ask healthcare providers, why do you think your patient didn't take it? 82% of the time, the healthcare provider says it's because the drug caused side effects. They ask the patients why they didn't take it. Half said it's side effects, 42%. So the doctors think you're not taking your medicines because you're experiencing side effects. Patients think that you're not taking it because of adverse effects, 42%. There's this treatment fatigue deal, it's 13%. You're just sick and tired of getting treated. It reminds you that you have MS because you have to take it. Practical issues related to an injectable, 9%. Perceived lack of efficacy, you don't think the drug's working, 9%. And then you got some rarer things, you forgot it. How many times do you forget to take any drug? Pretty frequently, sometimes you just forget it. This is a big thing, lack of realistic expectations. So you think the drug is gonna make your fatigue better, you think the drug is going to make something, some of these symptoms better, but they're not designed to do that. They're designed to attack your MS, not so much treat your symptoms. Impaired cognitive functioning, maybe you forgot to take it because you, 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 know, you need a reminder. You're not thinking as clearly. Maybe you're depressed. So those are the, the trouble with adherence. So the doctors, you come in and they think you're having side effects, but they don't ask you these other things why you stop taking your drug. And if it's um, lack of efficacy or not understanding that the drug won't treat your symptoms, I have to tell the patient that, you know, that's, that's not right. So, you have the disease itself, that's what the, these disease-modifying therapies do, and then you have the secondary impairments which lead to abnormal symptoms. So if you treat the disease, you may not have as many impairments, but the drugs won't improve those impairments. This is also a uh, interesting thing. So, this was published uh, by Day in June of 2018. This Narcoms, have you heard of the Narcoms Registry? These are patients with MS. It stands for North American Research Committee on MS. And there is about 9,102 participants. Are there anybody in this registry? One, two, wow, three, four. Okay, so uh, about 2,000 people uh, participated, they were asked, they got the data. And the top priorities in their DMT selection are as follows. This is why they chose uh, disease-modifying therapy. Improvements in quality of life, improvement of MS symptoms, and preservation of cognitive abilities. But when you look at the way the drug studies are done for relapsing MS, we look at relapses. Do you see relapses on there as number one? No. We look at MRI. Do you see MRI as number one? No. You look at uh, disability, maybe cognition, but the cognition is not physical disability. So you don't see that. So there's only about 20% of clinical trials that looked at these things. About 80% of the trials, there's no data. So when you go to your doctor and you ask them, I want a drug that will do this, this, and this, it, we don't have any information that this drug will do those things. So there's a mismatch. And doctors have to be aware of that, and patients have to be aware of that. So how do you communicate things with your neurologist? I need to know your personal goals, number one. You have to have assistance through various 
phases of MS, early diagnosis, later diagnosis, et cetera. Treatment decisions have to be kind of shared, and it has to modify the course of your disease process. And what's important early on may not be, as I mentioned, important later on. Relapse treatments we went over, and symptomatic therapy aside from DMTs are available for some of those symptoms. So I have that conversation. So how do you have the conversations? These are the four models of physician-patient relationships. So you didn't know that existed, did you? That there's how, how you, how, what kind of relationship you have with your doctor. This has been published down there. There's the, uh, the uh, references. Let me go through each four of those briefly. The first was the way physicians were taught decades ago, paternalistic. What do you think that means? Uh, fathers know best, yeah. Or mothers, right? Particular treatment is chosen without providing alternatives or adequate explanation underlying the choice. You're told what to do. Because I know best, right? I'm the doctor. I went to medical school. I went to residency. You didn't. I got to tell you what to do. That's paternalistic. That's not the optimal way of doing it. But 10% of patients want that. I have patients coming in and they, I lead all these things and they go, they interrupt me. They go, doc, listen, I'll just do what you want me to do. 10% of patients. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I need to know that that's where they're coming from with that model. The second model is, is a little bit different, is called the informative model, inf information. So the patient is provided the facts, facts, regarding the risk and benefit of the treatment in a passive fashion, without any clarification from the healthcare provider. You get a, um, you get a handout from, you ever see those marketing tools? That's informative. The patient is provided facts about the risk and benefits. The doctor doesn't kind of explain things. They tell you, listen, go home. Here's all these marketing materials. You read it. You come back and tell me what drug you want. And uh, some neurologists do that. Now that we have so many different drugs, you're gonna need a shopping cart to, to go out of the office with, with all that stuff. So that's often used in marketing. Interpretive, help the patient select the treatment by providing all the options and determining what the patient actually prefers. So that sounds pretty good, right? All the options, and then you kind of uh, determine what the patient actually prefers, but then you don't influence their opinion. Maybe they take the wrong approach that I disagree with. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they, they say, well, listen, I, I went this drug because my neighbor across the street who has MS is on the same drug, and she really likes it. So that's the drug I'm going to go on. It may not be the right drug or the right choice that I would have chosen, but that, that happens. The last one is a deliberative type of model. Healthcare provider and the patient and greed uh, engage in a deliberation about what kind of health values the patient could and should pursue. I get in there mind what kind of values, as I mentioned, what's important for that phase in their MS journey. You need, in order to do that one, the patients really need to be adequately informed. You really need to know 
the ins and outs about some of these drugs, the ins and outs about MS, and that's why I applaud everyone for being here and, and attending uh, meetings like this because you're, you're, you're learning things. And so if a patient comes in and say, listen, I, I looked up this, I went to this, the, uh, these um, uh, seminars, blah, 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 and I, I, I think I know what I'm talking about. And you know, it's not that I quiz them, but I do sometimes, and 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 then I feel more comfortable about the, the decisions. So those are the four models of patient-physician uh, interactions. So, why is that more? Uh, I mean, important these days. So remember the electronic medical record? How many people like the electronic medical record where you go in and your doctor like is here and typing and they go, what are you, what are you doing? You know, and then so, so the electronic medical record is, is mandated these days to, to get data. And part of the electronic medical record is called meaningful use. Meaningful use is how you communicate, how you communicate with patients, how you communicate with insurance companies, and how you communicate with other healthcare providers. So that's meaning that's meaningful use. And they kind of shifted away from this paternalistic thing to a more two-way approach interactive discussion away from a paternalistic thing. And that allows for this shared decision making. So we think by doing that, um, it increases compliance and patient satisfaction and patient outcomes. That's, that's the goal. So, but there's a new player that's not in here. What, do you, what did you say? Insurance. Insurance. So the new player is insurance companies acting through what's called pharmacy benefit PBM companies. So you have to uh, go through some hoops. So the shared decision making, here's these, these things, right? Patient knowledge, meaningful use, you share the conversation, and then you make a decision along with your provider. Do I see the insurance companies in here? No. Do they uh, affect the decisions? Yes. Yeah. Right? So what happens is that, you know, this shared decision making requires that we discuss the risk and benefits of the drug. We come up with a plan A. I like to, in my mind, and sometimes I'll share this with my patients, I have plan B. If plan A doesn't work, I even have plan C, right? And you actively engage, and we think that it improves compliance and outcomes. And I think it does. But there's barriers. So there's these... PBMs, which are like tiered medication. You can't use this medicine until you use this medicine. And then you have to fail this before you use that. But in MS, failure is not good. I just said relapses are not good. So there's other things. There's formularies. If the drug is not on your particular formulary, and that can change year to year. There's different copays. So there are some kind of barriers. There could be different values between me and my patients, and I have to understand. You have to kind of understand that, and it's a learned skill. So there's different sources of information. So I'll just end on some of this information business. There's direct-to-consumer marketing. So what kind of shared decision-making is that? Remember, shared decision making is like the number two. You kind of uh, direct to marketing. Uh, you get this marketing thing brochure and you read it. That's direct to consumer. There's ads which are direct to consumer. There's forms 
like this, which is important, antidotal things like your neighbor across the street. That's probably not, uh, that doesn't rank up there as much. So, there, in order to have shared decision making, you have to have, patients have to be truly knowledgeable, as I mentioned. The doctor has to be truly uh, knowledgeable. And the docs have to, and the healthcare providers have to be flexible. And we have to kind of understand where you're coming from. So resources, there's resources from the neurologist, support groups, National MS Society, consortium of MS centers, like uh, uh, MS Views and News, different resources, which are reputable resources that are important. So what I try to do is kind of tackle this vague decision-making thing, and, and it's kind of it's kind of a daunting task, but what I try to do is kind of set up this multi-dimensional uh, team approach, list the team members, goals of treatment of MS, the disease-modifying therapies, that they're, they work differently for the most part, how you communicate with the team members and the person with MS, and finally uh, ended up on shared decision-making. So uh, my goal was um, to have you go away with maybe two or three things that are fresh and new for you that you haven't thought about before. And so if I've, if, if I've done that, I've done my job. So I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank Thanks. you, doctor. All right, this is going to be a little challenging for me, but I need you to put up your hands if you have questions so I could see where I'm going first, second, third. All right? I saw that. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I need to lose more weight. <laughs> All right. We're almost there. Who's next? All the way in the back, right? Um, the shingles vaccine, what's your opinion for people with MS? So the shingles vaccine, the older vaccine is alive vaccine and it's not recommended uh, for patients with MS. The newer shingles uh, vaccine is called Shingrix. It's given in two injections and it's okay. It is, it's, it is okay. If you can get it, there's, uh, there's kind of a shortage, right? Right. Yeah. A lot of my patients got the first shot and they've been waiting three months for the second shot. Can you wait longer than the three months? You gotta wait. Uh, I got to put a microphone in front of you every time before anybody speaks, all right? And by the way, notice he's got a different mic than I do now. He's got germs on there. <laughs> Can you wait longer if getting the second shot? I, I think you have to. Time frame? Yeah, that I, I don't know. Is there but, a time frame? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Is there any myelin uh, regenerative uh, studies being done or... Uh, products that are used to increase to, the myelin? Yeah, coverage? that's... That's kind of the, I don't want to say the holy grail, but we, there have been some products looked at to re-myelinate things and to the cell that um, makes myelin is called the oligodendrocyte. That's the cell that wraps around the axons. Right. And so um, there's a couple companies working on that. Uh, the, so there's nothing on the market yet. Let me do her, and then I'll get to you, all right? Um, when, when you mentioned lesions, how many lesions do you have before a doctor starts to get concerned? So uh, uh, how many lesions? Well, it all depends where the lesions are. I mean, you can have a lesion in part of your brain that really doesn't uh, do much, or you can have a lesion in the same size in a part of your brain that is vital. So it, it depends where the lesion is. So um, lesions are not good, but as I mentioned, sometimes you can have nine more lesions before you have any symptoms. It all depends where they hit. And it's random. That's the thing. Which vaccines are safe? Because I was told many, like for instance, tetanus vaccine, I had a a serious reaction when I had my last tetanus, so I will never have another one. Um, 
what what which vaccines are safe for MS patients to have? Yeah, it's usually the uh, the uh, killed or attenuated vaccines. So if you uh, go to the National MS uh, Society's website, uh, I I'm pretty sure they have some information about which vaccines. The the um, that comes up a lot with my patients that want to travel or do missionary work in in. Uh, like Africa, where you have to get the smallpox vaccine. And uh, I could be wrong, but I think that's a live virus. So it may be kind of dicey. So looking at live viruses, that are, that's kind of Yeah. If yes. so I'm not there with a the mic, can you repeat what she's saying or whoever says? OK. Thanks. Sure. What she's saying. So her, her issue was, her question was, what uh, live virus vaccines can you take, or what vaccines can you take? And uh, so basically, any non-live virus vaccine is you. Okay. okay. You mentioned about inactive um, MS. How long of a period would you have to wait to be in that category? So the way I approach things is when a patient, my patient comes in for their visit, perhaps every six months, wherever I put in the chart from the last visit there is uh, the patient has inactive MS they didn't have a relapse things like that so it's more of a it's not a, a, a fixed time but it just gives me a flavor of how the patient's doing if they've been inactive since 2000 you know 15 that's a good thing and if they've been inactive for six months, uh, I, you know, I just, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but it's better than being active. You were talking about MRIs. Is there a difference between A machine to a B machine or 64 slice or whatever? Yeah, uh, um, yes. I mean, that's a huge thing uh, uh, because the stronger the magnetic field, you can see more lesions. So if you're worried about counting lesions from one year to the other year, if you go on a weaker field, like a, what's called a 1.5 Tesla. Tesla is the, the uh, term that we use to, for the magnetic field strength. The higher the number, the stronger the magnet. So 1.5 to a 3, you can pick up maybe 15% more lesions that were there originally. And then all of a sudden you do it on a three Tesla, you think you have 15% more lesions, but it's just techniques. Over here. Oh, yep. you first. Oh, so they, that brings home a point too. A lot of patients, when they go to get their MRI, they don't know what strength it is. And you read the report, it's not on there. And that uh, I think it should be on the written report, but a lot of times, 90% of the time, in my experience, it's not. So I have to call up the facility or know, you know, and ask. So I ask my patients when they're in the machine or before they get in the machine, ask the technician, what's the field strength, and then just write it down. So simple. With the MRI, with the 3.0 and the 1.5, isn't there a variance as to the way that they're Taking slicing images, though? So the, the newer images are called the 3D reconstruction. Taking slices, not so much, sli I mean, you can slice a person's brain at a millimeter thing, but you've got tons of slices to look at. It take you, you know, a long time. So now there's uh, software that will reconstruct it in 3D looking at the the uh, things and it's it's really amazing the the advances in MRI we have yep. time for four more questions I'm gonna start here then there and then I don't know where okay I don't have a mess and what are some of the symptoms that so, make people come to you to find out what if they have it so M if you if you go on the internet and and put in MS symptoms you'll see everything that Everything can happen. Dizziness, lightheadedness, numbness, tingling, and that, that's the issue. Because a lot of people that will have dizziness or numbness, they Google that and, and it'll come up MS. And they're, they come into my office and they're convinced that they have MS, and I have to unconvince them. 
That's the that's the thing, which is a good thing, right? Which is a good thing, but uh, but the, it it's frightening. That's why you have to have uh, faith in your doctor to make the right decision. Yeah, the National MS Society. Yep. You as a neurologist, would you know the MRI places in and around your practice that would have the better? Yes. Okay, and you would yeah. suggest that to your patient? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Who's next? That's right. I forgot. <laughs> Silent lesions in the brain are fairly commonplace. How about in your spinal column? So if you had your initial workup and your thoracic spine and your cervical spine are clean, how far in the future do you do another one? Yeah, that's a good question because usually we'll do brains on a yearly basis. But if your initial spinal MRI is clean and you're not, not having any symptoms to suggest spinal things, which is weakness, numbness from like your neck down, then there, I tend not to do as many in follow-up, maybe every few years instead of every year. So it depends on your symptoms. Last question Thank you. back here. Dr. Negroski, we still don't know how to grow myelin. What's your opinion on neuroplasticity and brain training and learning to do new things? Do you feel that that can help us cognitively if we work on those kind of things? So this uh, condition called neuroplasticity, um, you, just think about this. I mean, when, when the brain is very young, it forms a lot of synapses or connections between brain cells. Uh, as the brain slowly ages, those connections are lost. So we see that with cognitive therapies, right? You're doing, you know, for patients with memory impairment, they, you should exercise your brain and do puzzles and kind of all kinds of things. <clears throat> so it's a little bit controversial if that actually builds things or is it just learning that you're doing your puzzle better? Because if you do another puzzle, you may not do as good. So um, I'm a believer that you should exercise not only phys physical issues with muscles and balance, but also cognitive abilities. Do you think we can change the brain with neuroplasticity in that way? I don't know. Can you repeat what she said? Yeah. So uh, she says, could we actually change the brain? By doing that and the answer is I I don't know but it won't hurt right so it won't hurt all right let's thank dr. Negroski <laughs> sorry hang on one second you had a question yeah I did I'm sorry I didn't uh, see, I, I see you pointing over that I know you're talking I ah, got it sorry we get to we get to thank him again <laughs> uh, my question my question is only about legalities and uh, why is an insurance company allowed to decide your quality of life? If the provider has a record of success with a patient and has given that patient a proper treatment, the insurance carrier to question their decision. Also, this is I, added I, in with Well, I, know I, I agree. <laughs> Just put that in the minutes. <laughs> okay, and also a patient is sometimes asked, does it work? Is that is that uh, uh, is Copaxin or whatever you're taking working? Uh, a lot of times the patient will answer, "The only way I'm really going to know is if I stop taking it," because the increase of how how well you're doing is over a long period of time, and your pain has no memory. You don't remember what happened last year, how it felt last year. Yeah. So, so, so how how do we? How do we approach that without having the patient stop taking that medication? So the, that gets into uh, if a patient is extremely stable on the drug, they're not having relapses, they're not having MRI activity, they're not increasing their disability, they're tolerating the drug, why would you want to stop it? So they're actually doing studies now. There's a study uh, in patients, I think it was the cutoff is 65 years of age. 
of age that are clinically stable. They fulfill some of those criteria. Um, they may be getting a little bit worse uh, from a disability standpoint, but they're being randomized either to continue the drug or stopping the drug. And they're going to be followed to see what happens, to see what the best decision is. And we don't know. The Europeans don't know either. There's a paper at both the US and the European uh, MS uh, kind of groups, and there's no guide guidance. We're guided to uh, share that information that we don't know what the best option is. So if you're feeling improvement, stick with it, don't move. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's thank Dr. Negroski. <laughs> thank you very much.